Hello everybody, Hooded Cobra Commander 788 here, and I'm back with another Comic Book Wednesday. Every Wednesday I will be looking at another G.I. Joe comic book from the Marvel Comics G.I. Joe A Real American Hero run, which started in 1982. Uh, so we're on our fourth issue now. I just wanted to remind everybody to go ahead and smash that subscribe button. And if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. And if you don't like this video, go ahead and give it a thumbs down. I'm okay with either way. If you're watching this video from some website other than YouTube, I would greatly appreciate it if you'd take a little trip over to the Hooded Cobra Commander 788 YouTube channel and go ahead and subscribe. I've got a lot of great comic book and G.I. Joe toy reviews coming up, and you don't want to miss any of that. So let's go on to our comic book review for today. The copy that I'm reading from is actually from a trade paperback, Classic G.I. Joe Volume 1. Uh, this is released by IDW Publications. Today we're looking at G.I. Joe number 4. And if you watched my previous comic book review video, you know I didn't care too much for G.I. Joe number 3. I thought it had too much science fiction in it. Uh, it kind of got away from the realism that we had been cultivating in the G.I. Joe series. Well, number 4 is going to be a different story. I really like this one and I'm looking forward to reviewing it. Let's start with the cover. The cover is kind of a generic action scene with the Joe team kind of running toward us, you know, with their guns firing. But I, I like it. It's a good design. It has Hawk wearing a beret for some reason. But, you know, it kind of looks like a poster. And I think if you had this image, you know, as a poster hanging on your wall, it, look, it would look pretty cool. So I like the cover. Moving on to the splash page. We have a close-up of a guy with a handlebar mustache, and uh, he's got this emblem on his cap that says, Strike First. Uh, not sure exactly who this guy is, uh, but he's, he's drawn a little bit oddly, but at least he isn't a giant robot. So already this issue has a leg up on G.I. Joe number three. We have a title, Operation Wingfield, uh, script by Larry Hama, plot and art by Herb Trimp. And we find out that Mustache Guy is Wingfield. He is some kind of drill instructor for one of those crazy militia groups, you know, the kind that goes up into the woods and they learn how to shoot guns and they plot the overthrow of the government, things like that. You know, one of those fanatical groups. Well, he's the leader of one of those groups. Uh, and we have some scenes where he's, you know, training some recruits and he's shooting live rounds of ammunition at them. Ends up shooting one of them in the leg but, you know, they're not going to take him to the hospital. He's just going to have to make do with a field dressing because he's really trying to toughen these guys up. He's backed up by his wife, whose name is Sherry, uh, and a guy named Carruthers. And I'm not sure exactly what Carruthers' role is. I mean, um, is he some kind of leader or is he a lieutenant? I'm not really sure. We find out that the footage we've been watching is actually an FBI surveillance video. And we're back in the G.I. Joe briefing room where Hawk is informing the Joe team that their next mission involves this fanatical militia group. This is a group that operates within the United States in Montana. And so that would normally be the FBI's jurisdiction. But they suspect that this group is getting funding and equipment from terrorist organizations, possibly even COBRA. And that moves it into G.I. Joe's jurisdiction. So the plan is for Hawk and Grunt to go undercover and infiltrate this group as new recruits, and Snake Eyes is going to back them up. When Hawk and Grunt arrive at the compound as new recruits, they make a note that some of the recruits have brought their families, and Hawk says that this is a way for Wingfield to control the, the recruits. Uh, he says that if you control a man's family, you, you control the man. So it's a way of Wingfield uh, ensuring absolute loyalty from his troops. So we're already not liking this Wingfield guy. He is a major asshole. We have a training scene where the recruits are going through an obstacle course. And of course, Hawk and Grunt are already elite soldiers. So they're having to 
basically act like they are inexperienced. They're trying to not look like they're already trained soldiers. And that's a little bit difficult because, you know, the new recruits, they're out of shape. They don't know what they're doing. But Hawk and Grunt, they're, they're already in great shape and they could beat this whole field of new recruits pretty easily. They're really trying to hold back. In the meantime, Snake Eyes is scoping out the place. He's making some notes. Uh, he's trying to figure out, you know, exactly how he's going to break in. And he spots a B-29 bomber uh, on the airstrip along with some other jets. And, you know, holy crap, this is not your average crazy militia. If they have jets and an airstrip and a bomber, you know, this is a group to be reckoned with. So I can really see why this would be high on the G.I. Joe team's priority list to, to check out this group. You know, where does this group get its funding? Where does it get these, you know, amazing uh, weapons and jets and everything? They definitely didn't pick these up at Walmart. Under cover of darkness, Snake Eyes cuts through the fence and sneaks into the compound. And at the same time, Hawk and Grunt sneak out of the barracks uh, to do some reconnaissance. Snake Eyes overhears a meeting with the officers of this fanatical group in which Wingfield tells them of this insane plan that he has. Apparently, Cobra has given this group two nuclear warheads. Two nukes. Uh, Cobra, first of all, how did Cobra get these nukes? And since Cobra had them, why would Cobra give two valuable weapons to a fanatical group? You know, this really, it seems like there's an untold story here. I'd like to know how these events came about. I'm not saying that it's totally implausible or I don't like this particular plot point. I'm just saying, how? I want more explanation. I want to know how it is that this happened. It seems like there's an interesting backstory here that's just never told. So Wingfield's plan involves putting a nuclear weapon on the B-29 bomber and flying it to Russia and bombing Vladivostok. And if that doesn't work, the backup plan is to detonate a nuclear weapon that's buried under the compound and blow themselves up. Uh, and this is really nuts. I mean, this is a crazy fanatical plan. Uh, now, the idea of bombing Russia in order to start a nuclear war, that's a little bit cliched. You know, that's been done to death, really, in, in other media, movies and stuff like that. Uh, but it does kind of show the level of fanaticism that we're dealing with here. I mean, this, this is a group that's willing to die for its crazy nut job beliefs. While Snake Eyes is eavesdropping on the meeting, Hawk and Grunt scope out the rest of the compound, where, and they make it to the armory, where they find a bunch of brand new Russian tanks. Well, they don't think that Russia would have given this group a bunch of tanks, so they think Cobra must have something to do with it. Unfortunately, they trip a silent alarm, and the whole camp comes to, to capture them. As we know, Hawk and Grunt are elite soldiers. Uh, they are members of the G.I. Joe team, which means they are highly skilled fighters. And they end up fighting off most of the camp that, you know, comes to stop them. But in the end, they end up being subdued just by sheer numbers. Hawk and Grunt are going to be executed at dawn. But of course, Snake Eyes jumps in and saves them. But it's too late. The B-29 bomber with the nuclear warhead has already taken off and is on its way to Russia. The team splits up. Hawk heads to the airfield where he's going to commandeer a jet and go after the bomber. And Grunt and Snake Eyes are going to go back to the compound and go after Wingfield. Grunt gets pinned down by enemy fire and Snake Eyes discovers that there's a cabin full of women and children, the families of the recruits. And essentially, Wingfield is holding them as human shields. Uh, he insists that the children be armed uh, so that they can fight off the G.I. Joe team. Uh, so he's basically trying to turn them into child soldiers. Now, this is really sick. I mean, this guy, uh, you know, I hate this guy. I honestly hope they take this guy out. Hawk snags one of the jets, but he doesn't realize that he's taken a jet that does not have a working radio. So he's unable to radio the G.I. Joe team, and when he catches up with the bomber, he's unable to radio Carruthers, who is piloting the bomber, uh, to turn back. 
Uh, he has no choice but to shoot down the bomber, uh, and Carruthers has a chance to jump out, but he doesn't. Now, I like this element in that Hawk is not trying to cause any unnecessary death. Uh, he would rather save Carruthers' life uh, at the same time as thwarting his evil mission, but uh, Carruthers ends up dying, not because Hawk specifically wants to kill him, but because he refuses to jump out of the airplane uh, as it's going down. Carruthers sacrifices his own life rather than be captured. Back at the nut factory, uh, Wingfield activates the nuclear warhead that is buried underneath the compound, and so he starts a 10-minute timer, and in 10 minutes, it's going to blow up the whole compound and everybody there with it, including all the women and children. Well, one of the wives of the recruits is there with her child, and he's, she says, no way, I'm out of here, dude, you're nuts. Wingfield pulls his pistol on her, and he's going to shoot her in the back. Uh, he says to his wife, you know, Sherry, you got to back me up here, and this is right after he just told her to shut up. Uh, so now he wants his wife to back him up, and well, his wife does back him up in some way. He, she shoots him in the back. You know what? This is a fitting end to a real jerk. Um, I'm glad he died. I mean, you know, I, I like Hawk. I don't like to see unnecessary deaths. Uh, if, if somebody doesn't have to be killed, uh, then I'd rather see that person captured and brought to justice. I don't really have too much trouble with Wingfield being killed. He's a real dick, and he really deserved it. The rest of the G.I. Joe team arrives, they crash through the door, and you know what, it's really nice to see the whole team in action. We actually haven't seen the entire G.I. Joe team in action since the first issue. There's an odd dialogue mistake that runs through this entire issue in which Stalker is referred to as Ranger, as if his codename is Ranger. Of course, we know he is a Ranger, but his codename is Stalker. And I actually don't mind this. I mean, the word Stalker has taken on a very negative connotation since the 80s. But you know what? I think Ranger is a good alternative code name for Stalker. Uh, I know it's a little bit redundant so he because he is a ranger, but the code name Ranger still sounds kind of cool and it doesn't have the negative connotation that the word Stalker does. So you know what? I would go with changing Stalker's code name to Ranger. I would accept that. The G.I. Joe team has five minutes to disarm this nuclear weapon that's about to go off under their feet, and that job falls to Zap. Zap disarms the nuclear weapon with Grunt's help, and this is a really great scene. Uh, it, what I like about the scene is it doesn't fall into the usual bomb disarming cliches, like, oh, is it the red wire or is it the blue wire? And we don't see the typical timer countdown where, you know, they have to race the clock and they, they disarm the bomb just in time and the, the timer stops at 007 or something like that. Uh, we don't see all that and we actually don't know exactly how much time is left. We only find out after it's disarmed that there were only three seconds left before you know the nuclear weapon went off and all of them would have died. Uh, this is a very nicely played scene. I really like it. The scene builds up a lot of suspense without falling into those cliches. I think it's really well written, and it's my favorite scene of this comic book. I always like to talk about what was good and what was bad about every issue, and I'm going to start with the bad parts of this issue, and because there really wasn't very much. Uh, I was unsure about the kind of casual use of nuclear weapons in the story uh, without some kind of further explanation. But in this comic book, I thought it was used to pretty good effect, so I really didn't mind that so much. And you know something that I'd like to see that we haven't seen since the first issue? Uh, I'd like to see some of the classic G.I. Joe vehicles in action. It's nice to see the G.I. Joe team members in action, but, you know, I want to see the Vamp Jeep and the Mobat Tank. Let's see more of that. Also, Cobra is mentioned in this issue, but is never seen. And Cobra, of course, is the main adversary for G.I. Joe, but we've actually only seen Cobra in 50% of the issues so far. We saw Cobra in issue number one, and we saw Cobra in issue number three. And the G.I. Joe team didn't actually didn't fight Cobra in issue number three. They fought the giant robot. So it's been a while since G.I. Joe has faced off against its main adversary. 
Military Cobra. So I'd really like to see more of that. I'd like to finish up by talking about what was good about this issue. And there's a lot about this issue that is great. For one thing, it's more realistic than G.I. Joe number three. I mean, there really are these creepy guys out there in the woods with guns who want to overthrow the government. So this is not fantasy. You know, this is drawing on a real life thing. I like the fact that Grunt and Zap are given more to do in this issue. We haven't seen enough of them, and so it's really nice to see them in action and see their characters developed a little bit. We also see Hawk risking himself and not just sitting back in headquarters issuing orders, and that I think is nice. That's a good sign of a leader. There was much that I liked about this issue. I feel like since we're getting back to realism instead of science fiction, that the G.I. Joe comic book series is back on track. Uh, it makes up for what I think was a lackluster uh, third issue. I hope you liked this review. Uh, if you did, go ahead and give this video a thumbs up. Uh, if you didn't like this review, maybe you hated this issue, go ahead and give this video a thumbs down. And if you haven't subscribed yet, make sure you do, because there's a lot more coming up. Uh, thanks again for watching. This is Hooded Cobra Commander 7888, and I will catch you next time.